So I'd like to thank the Southeast Asian Research Center again for having me as a CERT lecturer. As Mark mentioned, this is my fifth uh, lecture and uh, you know you can consider me a regular. <laughs> and then again, who can uh, refuse an invitation from the Professor Mark Thompson, who is also a constant visitor uh, in the Philippines. He's considered uh, a, already a, a Filipino, a Pinoy. I would like to speak this afternoon about the Marcos political comeback in the Philippines. And uh, a couple of weeks back, uh, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr., the son and namesake of the former dictator Ferdinand Edralin Marcos, delivered his second State of the Nation address that marked his first year in power. And he, aside from the regular uh, listing of his so-called achievements in his first year in power, he introduced a new slogan, a marketing slogan for the Philippines. And he said, I know that the state of the nation is sound and is improving. The new Philippines has arrived. Now, for those of us who are old enough to remember the new government's slogan, New Philippines, uh, evokes memories of his father's authoritarian rule, which was then called Bagong Lipunan. So, New Philippines, Bagong Pilipinas. Um, his father's uh, regime was called Bagong Lipunan, or New Society. In fact, um, a couple of years after Ferdinand Marcos placed the entire country under martial law and instituted his authoritarian regime, he reported to the nation in the six years since the proclamation of martial law in 1972 and the establishment of the new society, we have achieved much under the Republic. Of course, up until then, things seem to be positive for the Bagong Lipunan of Ferdinand Marcos. But after that, everything went haywire. Of course, the rest is history. Eventually, the economy would suffer from external shocks. Uh, there would be allegations of massive plunder and corruption with crony capitalism and the like. Uh, his arch-rival, Benigno Minoy Aquino would be assassinated, ushering in a period of great political instability that would result in the first people power uprising and resulting in the ouster of the Marcos dynasty, the Marcos dictatorship in 1986. But then again, several decades after, no? Uh, Ferdinand Bongbong Marcos Jr., popularly known as BBM, no? the late dictator's son, was proclaimed the 17th president of the Republic of the Philippines last May 25, 2022. He won a record uh, 31.6 million votes or 59% of the votes. And the margin was 31% ahead of his closest rival, then Vice President Maria Lenny Robredo, who narrowly defeated him in the previous 2016 elections. So after 36 years, no, the son of the dictator won by a large margin after his family was forced out of the palace by a military-backed people power uprising. So... For scholars who have studied democratization, one of the puzzling outcomes in most countries that underwent democratic transitions is the return to power of personalities who have deep roots in dictatorship. My presentation for this afternoon would like to tackle three points. First, how did the Marcos dynasty succeed 
in staging their political comeback? Second, what factors contributed to the erosion of the post-Marcos liberal reformist political order? And third, what are the prospects for Philippine democracy under a restored Marcos presidency? Now, myth-making is at the heart of the entire Marcos narrative. Truth and the Marcoses have always had a problematic relationship. And two generations of the Marcoses uh, created this myth you know, that provided the ideational cement that would bound the different factors that have been identified by various analysts and pundits as the reasons why they were successful in their comeback. Um, in, since last year, no, there have been a lot of explanations provided on the, the keys to success of the Marcos comeback. Some would say it's about constituencies, bailiwicks. Some would say it's about nostalgia. Some would say it's social media disinformation and propaganda. While all of this provides some explanation to the rise or the return of the Marcos dynasty, these are all, and I would like to assert, no, uh, necessary but insufficient in explaining the comeback of the Marcoses. And let us discuss myth-making first. Myth-making has always been, as I've said, at the heart of the Marcos narrative. Uh, from the very beginning, when he was still uh, plotting his rise to political power from being a representative or a congressman from his home province of Ilocos to becoming senator and eventually uh, uh, planning his campaign to become president and then his re-election, uh, he has exaggerated many of his exploits. True, he was a brilliant uh, law student who was involved in a scandal. He was accused of assassinating his father's uh, uh, arch rival in his province and he defended himself. And that actually jump-started his political uh, career you know, eventually. And he became a uh, one of those uh, guerrilla fighters during the Japanese occupation. But in all of his narration of his personal experiences, there was this element of meat-making. You know? So his astute use of biography and even cinema, which was the most popular... Uh, uh, mass medium back then, uh, in pursuit of his destiny, to his even when he became president, actual attempt to rewrite the nation's history in his image. No, uh, in the Filipino mythological legends, no, he and his wife Imelda Marcos were the malakas and maganda, the strong and the beautiful. Uh, legendary deities of Philippine mythology. So Marcosian online propaganda uh, in recent years have revived this myth-making and in fact have normalized the excesses of the older Marcos and martial law uh, and confronts the nation through social media, textbooks, and more recently, uh, they have also uh, produced another set of movies that would try to explain the side of the Marcoses. But the seeds of these exaggerations and even lies and even misrepresentations were planted even a long time ago, you know, during the time of the father. Marcos Sr. had a keen sense of history and his place in it. And he even commissioned some historians from the University of the Philippines to ghostwrite his version of the history of the, of the country from his perspective. So myth-making is the overarching uh, framework. But that's only part of the uh, explanation. 
Others have pointed to bailiwicks or constituency. There have been one, two, three, four, five, six elections since the EDSA revolution of 1986. And notice, um, in all these elections, uh, uh, there have been three presidential elections in which there was a clear sweep. In 1998, when the populist former movie actor and action star Joseph Erap Estrada won with a convincing majority, a landslide victory, and in the 2010 uh, presidential election, which saw the rise of the second Aquino presidency, Benigno Noinoy Aquino, the third, the son of uh, the martyrs, martyred former senator, Benigno Ninoy Aquino, and the former president, Corazon Aquino. And then in 2022, this massive landslide. Now, in the literature of Philippine elections and Philippine campaigns, uh, the ethno-linguistic vote is the most secure source of votes for national candidates. And this variable has been a consistent predictor of voting behavior since 1946. Specifically, what is known in the literature as bailiwicks or in Filipino, balwarte, or a candidate's natural area of influence is indicated by one's ethno-linguistic, regional, or provincial types. So, um, definitely, the Marcoses have always been strong in their home region in the north, the so-called solid north, the northern parts of the Philippines. But how did he manage to consolidate the rest of the country, particularly a large swath of the Visayas and Mindanao? So how did BBM consolidate the various ethno-linguistic bailiwicks? The second factor is the consolidation of the country's dominant political dynasties. Arroyos, Duterte, Estrada, Marcoses, Romualdez, and Villar. And... You know, I've written a lot about dynasties in the Philippines. Uh, it was a topic of my own doctoral dissertation, and I've been writing about it. But I've always uh, insisted that uh, clans and not political parties have been the building blocks of Philippine politics. No? So we have parties, but it's largely uh, anchored on political clans and families. No? So... Um, for the longest time, uh, dynasties have ruled, have dominated Philippine politics. Uh, until 2019, under President Rodrigo Duterte, uh, there was a slight decline in the number of dynasties elected at the local and even national level. And there were some prominent national dynasties who were defeated. Uh, Part of the uh, explanation why dynasties have dominated uh, the post-Marcos period is that uh, we can use the concept uh, popularized by James Loxton uh, called authoritarian vestiges. Because most of these clans and dynasties, while they have been integrated in the post-authoritarian democratic order and even joined democratic political parties, most of them were members of the authoritarian regime of Marcos and the authoritarian of party of uh, Ferdinand Marcos. So they simply switched from the authoritarian regime, transferred to the democratic parties, but they were still loyal to the dictator, most of them. Okay. So ironically, it was one of the former presidents, who's also a member of a political dynasty, uh, former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, no? uh, ironically, who ascended to power in the second people power uprising at EDSA. Uh, she was the one who orchestrated the consolidation of all this powerful political dynasty to support the tandem of Bongbong Marcos 
and Sara Duterte, then mayor of Davao and the daughter of Rodrigo Duterte. So in Game of Thrones lingo, no, the Kingdom of the North, the House of Marcos, no, consolidated with the Kingdom of the South, the House of Duterte, no. And of course, with the joining of forces between these two, uh, it resulted in that landslide victory and sweep. However, in uh, political marketing and campaign, the role of dynasties and political machineries, patron-client ties, clientelism, etc., they explain the push factor meaning the machinery and the the political bosses that uh, uh, push the candidates to the voters. But it does not explain the pull factor. What was it in BBM or even with Sara Duterte that attracted 31.6 million voters? Now, what drove millions to vote for Bongbong Marcos? So that's another question. Well, uh, the most popular explanation you know, given even by those who supported the uh, the defeated uh, uh, presidential candidate Lenny Robredo is that Marcos benefited from an early investment in massive online propaganda machinery. The use of social media. No? So Marcos Jr. was an early adopter of social media. I don't know if some of you here or if most of you here are active in social media. Were you familiar or are you familiar with Friendster, no? the precursor of Facebook? No? <laughs> so some of you are nodding. So yeah. I think the only guy in this room who's not on social media or not active is Mark Thompson. No? So <laughs> But I see everyone's nodding. No? So uh, uh, it's a precursor of Facebook. No? And as early as 2004, uh, BBM already had a Facebook account. No? By 2010, some slick revisionist videos were circulating online as well. And some pseudo-historic and conspiracy-based website trying to explain the EDSA revolution from the per, from the POV, you know? so if you're if you're a social media person, you would know POV from the point of view of the Marcoses. So pro Marcos disinformation campaigns have dominated both Facebook and YouTube. The Marcos disinformation uh, machine targeted young voters in TikTok. But then again, while this explanation is convincing, it is incomplete and it fails to account for a simple question or a simple observation. Not all 31 million who voted for BBM were misled. Because if you say that they were just you know, misled by social media, it's as if they're unthinking robots or zombies who would just accept all the propaganda of the markets. And some surveys would show that there were those who are actually who believe in the EDSA revolution, who believe in the Aquinos, who actually shifted to supporting Marcos. Why? No. So most actually consciously chose to vote for Marcos. No. So why? No. So some would say it's because of nostalgia. No, uh, author authoritarian nostalgia is in one form or another is you know is on the rise, especially in Asia. And authoritarian nostalgia is nostalgia for uh, the authoritarian past. In some Asian countries, it's tantamount or equivalent to the authoritarian developmentalist state, no, or the developmentalist authoritarianism that was or that were common in Asia. And it can refer to, you know, uh, an aspiration or longing no? uh, to bring back uh, the good old days. In some cases, uh, authoritarian 
memories, whether it was successful or not, or whether the success was imagined or not. No? And uh, it points to another argument in the Philippines called democratic ambivalence. And several surveys have pointed, no? based on the Asian Barometer, uh, Barometer Index, regardless of the percentage of satisfaction with the, de why de the way democracy works, large majorities of committed Democrats outnumber the minority of conditional Democrats. So they point to democratic ambivalence. While then again, this might be true, uh, a large number of Filipinos prefer democracy, but they prefer a disciplined democracy. They prefer order. Uh, there's a need for a strong leader. No? And this is the basis for some of this democratic ambivalence and authoritarian nostalgia. But the problem is, in the Philippines, while we can point to the rise of Duterte and the return of the Marcoses as, as uh, indicators of democratic ambivalence and authoritarian nostalgia, we miss the fact that there have also been periods in post-authoritarian Philippines in which there were strong periods of democratic nostalgia. People looking back at EDSA, at the People Power Revolution and how uh, democracy was returned to the Philippines. And this was particularly uh, evident during the EDSA II, uh, People Power Uprising, and the death of Corazon Aquino, which resulted in some form of nostalgia for good governance, which catapulted uh, to the presidency the son, Noy Noy Aquino. Okay? So, having said all of these, uh, I propose a framework for trying to tie all of these different explanations. And I use and I adapt uh, one variant of the institutional approach called discursive institutionalism. Uh, while there are explanations, while all these explanations are valid and plausible, they are somehow incomplete. Uh, why? Because the analysis offered either robs social actors of agency or they credit much agential power to Marcos Jr. and his supporters. No? So I would like to view the Marcos victory from the perspective of discursive institutionalism, which is a variant of the institutional approach in political science that highlights the link between ideas and institutions. It emphasizes the explanatory role of ideas and discourses in understanding institutional continuity and change. And one of the uh, proponents of this is the political scientist Vivian Smith. No? So discursive uh, institutionalism, no? uh, the discursive part asserts that ideas matter, and these ideas are actually stories no? that give uh, sense to uh, the complexity of the world. No? And these stories are what we call narratives. No? And institutions matter because, like for example, in the Philippines, the Philippines has been considered to be to have a strong presidency within the weak state, but the narrative that contributes to that institutionalization, the continuing strength of the presidency and the weakening of the state depends on the discourse. And the key sometimes to change or the key to explaining continuity and change is about the narrative. So in the case of uh, the return of the Marcoses, it was a case of changing or flipping the narrative. For the longest time, for 36 years, more than three decades, the dominant narrative in the Philippines was that of the liberal reformist narrative. Now, the Marcos narrative you know, can be categorized into three acts. The first act, when they were still out of power, is how do they explain the wealth? 
and this was actually the same uh the same uh, dilemma of then politician marcos while uh, rising up to uh, the different levels of uh, elected political position he had to explain the source of his wealth so when marcos was still a senator and until he became president uh he and Imelda Marcos explained that the source of their wealth was the Yamashita treasure. <laughs> that Marcos actually found the Yamashita treasure, and that was the source of their wealth. No? And this, for the longest time, was the, the justification. No? Then later on, they invented this, this high tale, this fairy tale, that uh, uh, there was this uh, ancient, uh, royalty in the Philippines that hired then lawyer Marcos to become their uh, lawyer and they, Marcos was given uh, tons of gold and this is called the Taliano gold. No? So these tales, these stories, these narratives have been propagated in social media. So that's the first act. Defend the Marcos legacy and the source of their wealth they point to the golden age when the Philippines was uh, was only second to Japan, which is absolutely false, of course. Uh, but, you know, nonetheless, it was spread in social media. The second is that they, they took offense at their ouster and Marcos Jr.'s defeat in the vice presidency in 2016. They played the victim's or the victim card. No? The third act, in which uh, now that they're back in power, no, it is the narrative of redemption. It is their destiny, or it is Bong Bong's destiny to complete his father's mission of making the nation great again. Now, the Marcos narrative claims that they were victims of the 1986 people power uprising. But victimhood is only one part of the Marcos narrative. The more powerful part is redemption. For most observers, redemption was the only platform Marcos Jr. presented to the electorate in 2022. So some would say that after the first year, his first year in office, well, he's he's seeking to redeem his family's honor and redress his family's fall. And some are willing to give him a chance. Now, 13 years earlier, another son benefited from political nostalgia. No, 13 years ago, Corazon Aquino, the former president, died. And suddenly, her death unleashed this nostalgia for the EDSA People Power Revolution and good governance because this was after uh, years of, uh, of alleged corruption under the uh, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo presidency. So the death of Cory, President Corazon Aquino, reinforced the Aquino narrative, which was supposed to be a democratic narrative. It was a narrative of sacrifice, death, and political resurrection. Noinoy no, no Aquino, this time to use uh, uh, reference to Star Wars, no? was supposed to bring back balance to the force. right? So Noinoy no Aquino was supposed to revive the liberal reformist narrative, but eventually failed. So in the Philippines... A presidency can be a prequel or a sequel to an ongoing narrative. Given the absence of ideologies and programs, we speak of political narratives as the stories presidents tell. And Mark and I have written extensively on this. We're still working on our, our book on uh, political narratives, presidential political narratives in the Philippines. No? So this narrative served to coalesce support from dominant strategic interest groups. Uh, these strategic groups can be the military, business, church, civil society, the U.S., etc. 
whose backing can make or break a presidency, or what is known in political science as the winning coalition. In the post-Philippine EDSA uh, regime, liberal reformism of Cory Aquino supplanted Marcos's authoritarian developmentalist narrative. Uh, liberal reformism emphasizes the good in good governance. No? It is based on anti-corruption uh, and moral politics. Okay, so until a major challenge, no, a counter-narrative emerged, a traditional populist narrative coming from the uh, former actor, very popular uh, politician, Joseph Erap Estrada. No? But his, his type of populism is a nationalist populism, uh, similar to uh, traditional nationalist populists in Asia. Later on, another populist would emerge who would totally demolish no, the liberal reformist narrative, and that is the uh, violent populism of Rodrigo Duterte. I will just briefly explain no, uh, that a presidency can emerge, a narrative, a presidency can emerge when a political narrative is strong or whether it's weak. And a president can be uh, elected at the time when the dominant narrative is strong or the dominant narrative is weak. My point is that Rodrigo Duterte no, uh, greatly affected and diminish and even demolish the dominance of the liberal reformist narrative that was founded by Corazon Aquino after EDSA. And it was the populism of Rodrigo Duterte that paved the way for the second coming of the Marcoses. In a way, Rodrigo Duterte was the John the Baptist to the second coming of the Marcoses. Okay? So he paved the way for the return of the Marcoses. Now the question is whether the election of Bongbong Marcos to the presidency would result in the total repudiation of the EDSA Republic and the revival of the developmentalist regime of the Marcoses, be it authoritarian or not. That is the question. I will I'll just briefly explain this. Rodrigo Duterte was the product of a long legitimation crisis. Up until 1998, the Philippines was on its way to consolidating its democracy until uh, the ouster of Erap Estrada in the Second People Power Revolution, which ushered in a long period of uh, uh, legitimation crisis that, were, that was not really resolved for three, close to three decades. And this resulted in the rise of Duterte and has contributed to the return of the Marcoses. Now, how is, uh, how is the Philippines under the second Marcos presidency? Well, the sky did not fall, no? Uh, you know, <laughs> there were fears that, uh, you know, uh, dictatorship would return, etc. But there was a peaceful democratic transition, which was good. Uh, he there was a return of president the presidential style of leadership after Duterte's populist style. Uh, BBM appointed technocrats and professionals in the cabinet and uh, gave detailed economic plans and uh, uh, successfully uh, implemented the pandemic exit plans. No, uh, 
it wasn't really the end of the drug war, but at least uh, there were no more, uh, uh, you know, high-profile uh, bloody incidents. No, um, there was a foreign policy course correction, especially with regard to uh, U.S. and uh, China. No, but on the negative side, there continues to be some allegations of automated election fraud. No, that's not yet been. Uh, satisfactorily uh, uh, explained no, by the uh, government agencies involved. There are still continued troll attacks, disinformation, historical distortion, and even red tagging. Even between and among Duterte and Marcos supporters. No? Now they're after each other. No? Uh, Marcos, the first year of the Marcos, the second Marcos presidency was marked by runaway inflation, uh, particularly the high prices of agricultural products. Ironically, uh, he sits as concurrent Secretary of Agriculture and he has not appointed any full-time Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, he expended his a large part of his political capital to uh, setting up a sovereign wealth fund, a Maharlika investment fund, but most people are afraid that this might be a repeat of the same problem in Malaysia no, with Najib. Then uh, he refuses to fully cooperate with the International Criminal Court in, the, in its investigation in the alleged extrajudicial killings under the Duterte administration. And they're this early because in 2025, it would be the midterm elections uh, in the six-year term of the president. There are already emerging cracks in his uh, ruling coalition. So, what are the prospects? Uh, what are the possible scenario under the second Marcos presidency? Uh, a number of those who did not vote for him, as I've said, are willing to give him a chance. Uh, uh, some of the those who voted for Lenny Robredo are happy with his foreign policy decision. Uh, some of those, uh, some of his allies in the, uh, within the Duterte camps are are still uh, aligned with him. No, so redemption is within his reach if he will avoid his father's mistake. No, so there are four possible scenarios. No, well, one is. He will repudiate eventually the EDSA Republic. He will push for constitutional change. He will lift term limits. He might even change the form of government to federal parliamentary. Or second, he will just be Marcos Light. And that's actually what he is right now, Marcos Light. No? Not as ruthless or brilliant as his father, Machiavellian up to a certain extent, more of a soft authoritarianism or again as the millennials would call it gv good vibes no instead of og strongman right then he might even be like noy noy aquino no benign no he will go through the motions appoint technocrats read his speeches well uh, attend state visits and stick to the narrative just like noy noy aquino stick to his narrative of to win the daan no? or the straight path. Or we might see a K-drama no? like Park Yun-hye, the daughter of South Korean Park Chung-hee, who apologized for the sins of her father and was elected the first woman president of uh, South Korea, but she was impeached, no? accused of corruption. So this is just the beginning. A lot uh, will still happen. And thank you very much for your kind attention.